Hi, this is Ian Wright, and today I'm going to pick up on where I left when I was talking about the kind of minefield, which is nutrition these days. And I wanted to to start to talk about the rather complex subject again of nutrition for children, um, and it's a problem. You know, uh, childhood obesity is incredible um and the it's growing rapidly and it's and it causes real issues um and the tendency for children to be drawn to sugar based highly processed foods is it's like a ticking clock for their health as they get few, the, as they get older so something has to be done and it has to be done from the very beginning and i'm just going to talk about actually nutrition from the very beginning, from early life. And we talked a little bit actually about um, pregnant mothers and that they are, they start to eat intuitively. You know, they're drawn to certain foods and that could be because there are certain minerals, vitamins, um, amino acids and proteins that actually the the children need and it creates a craving in the mother. And it's often one to listen to. I know with my twins, um, their mother craved curries <laughs> the whole time. Who knows why, but she did and she doesn't normally. So, I mean, we'll start with babies, obviously, and this is not in the scope of this discussion. Breastfeeding is, there is no comparison between breastfeeding and bottle feeding babies, um, there just is not because of the prebiotics, the immune regulators, the setting up of the gut biome. There are so many unknown cofactors in breast milk that are vital for the kind of maximum formation of the immune system, the nervous system, the organ system, the musculoskeletal system in babies. It's so big that, I mean, you know, we've talked about this before, and the research is ever increasing about the importance of breast milk. So I'm not, this is not for here. Ideally, breast is best, obviously, for many, many reasons. I'm going to start talking really more about weaning and what to do around weaning and how we can set up good tendencies in a child from very early on um, because actually a lot of children who come in to see me seven, eight, nine years old with specific um, behavioural or um, learning issues who have very much difficulties in food, diet and eating. So there are a lot of different factors involved with this and there can some of them can be to do with untreated reflux patterns or um, problems with the vagus nerve, which actually have been there since when they're very young. So there's a lot of other factors involved. But generally, when is the best time to wean the baby? Now, a lot of people are talking about and starting to bring in solids at four months old. And I personally don't agree with that. I think that six months is the cutoff date. And I know that the World Health Organization and the American Association of Pediatrics, etc., had all agree and say the six months is the right time. But increasingly, you know, baby's still hungry, baby needs some food. Well, actually, putting more solid food into a baby's gut too early when the immune system is immature can set up difficulties later in terms of allergies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, there is an argument the other way saying that you, you give a child so many different things um, and it will stop their tendency for allergies later. But that's true. But I think the key point here is timing. Um, the immune system of the gut has to be mature. You know, in, in the animal world, the kind of natural age of weaning is is around the eruption of their, their permanent molars, which is, you know, five to six the equivalent of five to six years old. Um, now, I think that's that's going a little too far, but I think that there is a there is a, a natural timing, and after six months, in my view, if you can hold off as long as that, you know, some children it's very hard to, um, but slowly introducing certain foods. I mean, I wouldn't in, introduce things like peanuts, wheat, gluten, seeds, eggs 
shellfish, except things like that are too difficult for the gut and they can set up problems, obviously. And, and so it has to be very simple, bland foods. Obviously, it's broken down. In, in, in um, certain indigenous childs, uh, tribes, I mean, obviously, that's less and less uh, practised. Uh, there's this whole idea of pre-mastigation where mother chews stuff and gives it to baby. I mean, that happens in the animal world as well. Um, obviously, there's difficulties with that with um, the in the developing world with regards to um, disease transference and stuff like that. But it, it's an interesting thing. So the, the the food has to be broken up to some degree because the 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 enzymes, the digestive enzymes of the child aren't fully functioning yet. Um, they're only just waking up from sort of six months old. So you, you can have difficulties in, in, ter- in terms of the digestive process. So ideally between six and eight months, you know, a couple of meals a day, very small amounts, very small amounts of, of food that has been um, mashed up or semi-solid foods, etc. cetera. Um, and so the thinking is at around 12 months, if you can, you start giving the baby solid finger foods meaning that you just put little bits of stuff down for them to play with and they can and for me actually I would start this younger even because even when there are there aren't enough teeth in there because they can their gums can chew on it and they can kind of wrangle with it it's good for um teething also I think having playing using their hands is obviously good for their hand-eye coordination and putting bits of food in the mouth and feeling them out so they're using their tongue they're using their lips they're moving it all around they're moving it against their gums to try and release the kind of tension in the gums and that is very good as a sensory stimulation for the mouth it's very it's, it can it be important in terms of feeding patterns later it can stimulate that also once you get to 12 months old i think it's very important actually that they have a wide variety of food they, the children should be having little bits of everything that the adults have you know okay not of indaloo curry but um a, lots of the different kind kinds of food so actually if you bring in a wide variety of foods quite early on um it means that their bodies then as the the the, the digestive process is becoming mature they are understanding different foods and actually they can get a wide and obviously in terms of nutrition the wider the nutritional um scope the better it is for the for the person and it also helps in terms of the developing bacteria in the gut which is huge and again it's for another podcast which we've done a stuff on before um so Starting off, you know, I, I with our kids, we start off with like something like a little bit of organic pear, which helps with the bowels and things like that. A little bit of vegetables, um, unprocessed, you know, sugar, forget it, you know, absolutely not. Natural sugars in fruit, okay. Um, maybe a little bit of organic rice and stuff like that. Some cereals are hard, hard to digest when they're very young. But if children have do this thing which is what i mentioned last time which is this when they're young this intuitive feeding so if you put five different things in front of them they will pick up and they will chew and they'll start eating the one that their body actually na- needs and if you can help a child when they're very young to develop this intuitive feeding thing it can be helpful a lot later i think so i mean jumping now i think to problems um, and problems which I mentioned earlier, which is when there is a difficulty in terms of eating certain foods, not eating things. I, I mean, there's a, the amount of children who I who I treat who, for example, will only eat white foods. They don't like colours. Children aren't drawn naturally to green foods. They're they're they you know white, maybe orange. They like these kinds of colours. And there's some kids that just won't eat anything. And there are some children who I've, I've treated over the years who say, well, only, only eat chips, you know, if they've got very severe autism or um, ADHD type patterns and, and they they literally will, won't eat anything but chips or sugar or, you know, that kind of thing. And we have to change that ship around slowly. And it's, it's a hard process, but we have to get the gut functioning better, the gut biome function better, the nerve supply to the gut better actually and once that starts once you start to get a little bit of window in their function they they can start improving it but 
if you've got a child, this is the problem because I, and I encounter this a lot at the beginning. If you've got a child who will only eat one kind of food and that's it, they won't eat, they will throw up at the sight of anything else. You know, the, the reactions can be extreme and it can, a lot of it can be neurological as well. And that's where I would want to have a look at it. But the only way is to not bring anxiety around feeding. So the first thing is, is the parent has to be calm. Everyone has to eat together. Even when they're young and they don't want to eat and they throw it on the floor and they have severe behavioral difficulties around it, there has to be calmness. So anxiety isn't brought into it, which is incredibly hard. Um, Don't force food on the children, but always have a degree of food around. So always keep introducing foods, even if they throw it on the floor every single time, eventually bring it in. And also you can say, look, one mouthful of that, and then you can have your whatever you have. Just one mouthful. And if they have their one mouthful, they can have the rest of it. And so you're slowly allowing the taste buds to acclimatize to different foods. And, And it's about persistence. It's about no anxiety. It's about not forcing it but it's about repeated, repeated um, bringing in little bits, little tiny bits of foods. It's also, the parents are role models, so you have to eat good, healthy food and sit right next to them and enjoy it and talk about it and bring this environment where food is safe. It's okay to be like this. I'm not going to punish you, but I'm going to still keep bringing in these new foods, and slowly things can start to happen. The whole idea of rewards is a complex one, isn't it? Because um, if you say, right, if you eat this bit of food, I will give you this reward of a sugar sweet or whatever it is, yeah? That means the child will be reinforced in their mind, the idea that the sugar sweet is the best thing. So is that counterproductive? Hmm, Possibly. So for me, a reward is, you know, they get a story or they get something that they want to do, you know, some time on the whatever computer or, you know, or, or a television program if they try one, two mouthfuls of this food. So if you make the reward something that's not related to food, I think that can be helpful. But if your child is really not eating anything at all, we need to also look at what's going on with, with um, the nerve supply to the gut. There can often be irritations in the gut wall, et cetera, et cetera, that need to be resolved. Um, but to try and get nutrition in, you know, to try and bring in things that are supportive to the natural gut flora is very important. Like, for example, bringing in a tiny little bit of soup, maybe, which you can put, make a, a bone broth. And we've done podcasts about this, about bone broth and the importance of those in terms of minerals and fats um, for the emerging digestive system and the gut biome of a child. Um, just a little mouthful, one one teaspoonful of something that's related to, to bone broth that's put over the chip, for example. You know, you have to, it, it's like little margins, little margins. Now these are more in extreme cases. So, but normally if you've got a normal developing child, keep it wide, keep it unprocessed. Uh, don't give them a taste for sugar, really. I think it's natural not to, you know, keep the food as organic as, as possible, as we were mentioning last time, because, you know, there is increased evidence about glyphosate and other um, pesticides being actually very harmful in, in terms of um, the development of the nervous system and many other things, actually. Um, so as healthy as possible, as unprocessed as possible and as wide as possible and allow them to understand their feeling of fullness it's you know for for a child who's obese it's normally a sugar related issue um, because sugar overrides your natural sense of when you're full there are other um, foods which are much better at allowing you to develop that sense which are complex carbohydrates vegetables and proteins but sugars override that so you lose this sense of fullness and when you do that you just tend to overeat um you know you know when you eat something sweet you're hungry in half an hour again 
you know, it's it's amazing. It has a very strong and natural reaction. So sugar is the one obvious thing to do. But actually, it's making food interesting, isn't it, for the kids? And, and you know, making cakes that aren't full of sugar. They they use natural things. And, and obviously, home-baked food is is completely the best but my goodness we can spend our whole lives doing food for young children it's a it's a huge subject um i'm going to talk about nutrition in particular cases and in particular situations like um i'm going to talk about nutrition and inflammation i think um in the next podcast because it's a very important subject um that's an introduction it's it's such a big subject um and i'm sure i'll I'll pick this up in specific areas later but um i wish you well